Three tomatoes are walking down the street. Papa tomato, mama tomato, and baby tomato. Playing catch up presents. Starring Lindsay Inkle and Jamie Nelson. So this is playing catch up, is it? I prefer something with a little more kick. Everybody's favorite condiment themed entertainment podcast. Put some hot sauce on my burrito, baby. Ha <laughs> ha sauce. Nobody. I mean, nobody puts ketchup on a hot dog. All right, you're listening to Hot Sauce on PlainCatchupPodcast.com. I'm your host, Lindsay Hinkle, and my co-host, Jamie Nelson, is here today, too. Hello. Hi, Jamie. Guess what? What? I'm wearing my footy pajamas. <laughs> it is a late night, isn't it? It is, and they're so fuzzy and pink, and they have bunnies on the feet. <laughs> my roommates love them almost as much as I do, but they're not allowed to wear them. You must be pretty cozy. I am, and I've got two blankies, and my bed's so soft, and there's so many pillows, and I got my teddy bear, too. Oh, that's adorable. Do you think this is a boy bear or a girl bear? I can't see it. In case you've forgotten, our, our studio is made of Skype. Oh, did you turn on the video? Um, girl bear, yeah. Okay, you can be a girl bear. Your name's Butch. <laughs> <laughs> Jimmy Fela is our guest today, and he is currently the MC at Gotham Comedy Club in New York City. Right now, he is uh, bringing on Jim Gaffigan, and once he's done with that show, he's going to run on over here and... Uh, have a chat with us. Are you excited, Lindsay? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You want to talk about jobs? Yeah, jobs are cool. I have one of those. You are super excited about this late night interview. <laughs> I can tell. Well, so let me tell you a story about jobs. Okay. When I was about 10, I thought I wanted to be an author because I had this really weird notion that um, being an author meant that you had a cubicle at Scholastic Books headquarters and that you sat in your cubicle from 9 to 5 writing novels. And sometimes an editor would come by and say, hey, this week we need a book about a little boy who gets trapped in a mine and a heroic dog saves him or whatever. Because like when I had gone to take your kid to work day with my dad, he worked in a cubicle. So I thought like the whole work world was like that, even for authors. And the weird thing is... Uh, Two years ago, I got to tour Scholastic Books, and even though by now I know that authors don't work there, and they do have cubicles, the weird thing is that this office is a million times cooler and more fun than even my 10-year-old self could imagine. My dream job at 10 was to work at Scholastic Cubicle Land, and the real Scholastic Cubicle Land is even more thrilling than my dream job of at that fanciful age. How insane is that, Lindsay? Lindsay? Lindsay! Are you serious? Oh, God. Oh, Jimmy's here, Lindsay. Wake up! All right, how's it going, Jimmy? I'm like really, uh, I'm kind of winded. Yeah? Well, thanks so much for running across the street to do this in the middle of the night. I wish you knew uh, what, like, I wanted to do this, obviously, uh, quite badly. But if you knew the physical undertaking that went into being here, because what happened was it was like 300 people. The show ended. I was only emceeing the show. So I had to, like, I went on to say goodnight with my jacket on (laughs) and ran here. And uh, it's like a normal night in New York, like a slight drizzle. But when you run out of a crowded showroom as the MC of the show. Right. It almost leads them to believe like you know something. It was bizarre, but I was happy to do it. Nobody blew up. I know, right? I will. will, So far that I know. I got to tell you, if someone did blow up, I'm clearly a suspect. (laughs) Yep. I'm definitely. And you're now like, uh, you know, guilt by association. Well, no, I think this is a good alibi, though. I was doing plain catch up. Do you you see that my uh, I don't know if you can see the video or not. Do you see my co-host, Lindsay? Yeah, what's the story? I see Lindsay's picture. No, no, no. That's live. Oh, get out of here. <laughs> Lindsay. So it, it's you and me, Jimmy. Let's get him. Let's get him, Jamie. I'm excited. Cool. I got. I have faith in us. I actually think it would be a great like version of The Tonight Show if they have a co-host in the chair that's asleep. <laughs> Every week. Andy Richter just sleeps through the show. You just get a dummy. <laughs> I think that. <laughs> I think it's pretty funny. The theme is jobs. Hooray. And I know you weren't always stand-up comics, so uh, I want to know about taxi driving. <laughs> it's a really, it's a really wild job. Um, how could I even explain it to you? It's really bizarre. First of all, if you really like talking to people, it's a much cooler job than you think. You know, a lot of people think it's all driving, 
you know, you're driving around in traffic, you're, you're, you know, you're fighting your way through intersections and stuff like that. But, but what you learn as a cab driver is you learn to have no emotional investment in how any of it goes. Like once you're in a taxi holding a steering wheel in the year like 2009, you've pretty much made peace with the fact that your life isn't going to work out. <laughs> and now it's just time to like get to know some people and figure out if you can, uh, you know, glean some direction in the world from them. It's kind of a cool gig in that a lot of people get in, they don't think they're ever going to see you again, which isn't true. Mm. And uh, it becomes, you know, you've heard it described as a confessional. Right. And it really is. People just get in and just dump anything on you. Anything. So what sort of things have you heard? I mean, I've seen, like, drug deals go bad, where, like, one guy dives in with, like, a gun in his lap and wants you to drive the Port Authority. Um, you know, you see people have sex. I've, I've seen a woman. I mean, uh, this is kind of a bad place to start the conversation. <laughs> but I've, I've seen, like, self-pleasuring. Oh, dear. I, I know. I feel like we're on the Disney Channel tonight. <laughs> Is this like midday or is this after the bars closed? This is the crazy thing. I drove days and a lot of people think that, you know, driving nights is psychotic. It's night. Everybody's out. They're crazy. But the truth is days are worse because the people that are still screwed up at like seven or eight in the morning are the real achievers in the world. Ah. You know, anybody can be drunk at two or three in the morning. If you're drunk at seven in the morning and you're still out and about, you know, you've accomplished something. So. You would get people that would get in. I had a guy once on a $4 fare. The fare was four ten. He gave me 50 bucks. And he was like, hey, man, uh, do you mind? Uh, you can keep this. Do you mind popping the trunk? I'm about to break into the store and steal some computers. Wow. I was like, get out of here. So you pop the trunk, you take the 50, and you just drive away. Wow. It's kind of like, it's kind of like hush money. He's kind of bought your silence. Sure. It's like, you know, if you're going to take the 50, you can't technically call the cops because you've kind of taken the 50. So etiquette says you give the guy a shot at it. Right. But the truth is the guy's not getting, you can't rob a computer store without a car. Can you, Jamie? Hey, com computers are getting smaller. Yeah, that's true. Too. Look at that. You know what? You know what's funny? You're right about that. He could probably pull it off now. He doesn't need me. I, what, what you and I just did is we lowered the rate of taxi bribery all over the city. We are doing good for New York. Steal more iPads. <laughs> Hey, I was working when they the first iPad came out and at the Apple store, they had paid people uh, like from other countries, from Europe and from Asia, because they weren't available over there, I guess. Oh. And they had paid people to stand in line and buy them so they can then immediately resell them. And these people could like pimp them out overseas. Oh, so I had people. I only knew that was the case because I picked up a couple of pen that was getting paid to stand in line. <laughs> That sounds like a pretty good job. Yeah, you get paid. To, yeah, exactly. You get paid to stay in line, but you don't get to keep the iPad. Right, right. So it's like you're, a, you're, you're right about to get hooked up with angry birds, and just as the bird flaps its wings, they just take it from you. <laughs> what a shame. Yeah, it's a little crazy. It's a little crazy. But if you, um, if you like talking to people, and, you like the, and if you like New York, like if you want to get to know the city, there's so much here that you wouldn't know existed unless someone instructed you to take them there and then screamed at you the whole way because you didn't know how to get there. Like, there is a mansion. There is an actual mansion, uh, and, and it's, 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 it's a house. It's not the way to describe a house in the city. A lot of times you hear a mansion, and it's like a town home, or it's a, you know like an eight-bedroom apartment in a building. But there's an actual mansion, a freestanding house uh, called the Jumel Mansion on 162nd Street and Audubon Avenue. I had never heard of Audubon. Uh, but there's something called the Jumel Square. It's up there. And this mansion uh, was home to this guy, Marcus Jumel, who uh, was a British loyalist. He fled the mansion when the Revolutionary War broke out. It became George Washington's headquarters for the duration of the Revolutionary War. And at one point hosted a dinner between the first three presidents of the country. What? Uh, the woman who lived there, Jumel's wife, who took the house back, went on to be married to uh, Alexander Hamilton, who had the famous duel with Aaron Burr. Did the guy in the back of your taxi tell you this? Like, what? I was insane. That's what I mean. It was insane. I was driving somebody up there who was going to, like, give a presentation. And I wound up, I wound up going there with family, like, after the fact, because I had heard about it. Right. And across the street from the mansion is a, is a, a run of row houses that were built in, like, the uh, early, early 1800s by the people who essentially went to lower Manhattan and built uh, the original, uh, basically the original city, like the Five Points area and like Park Row down where the uh, New York Times building used to be. Uh, and they lived in those row houses up there. And there's like a little marker, like a little placard telling you it's there. And, and it's across the street from a building uh, also in Jumel Square where Joe Lewis and Jackie Robinson live. Like really bizarre. 
proper history lesson right there. Uh-huh. I found I've found like middle of the night casinos where people take you to restaurants that double as like speakeasies at four in the morning and do a blackjack and stuff like that. I see. Crack houses. I mean, if, if you and the family want to get back into the crack thing, <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm being silly. What? Because uh, I know like in London, you to be a taxi driver, you have to like take like years of prep and stuff like what's the qualifications in New York? It's really, it's really weird. Um, you, you, uh, how do I even explain this? You have to, you do have to, it's not like London where they, that's a serious job in London. Mm-hmm. They have like health and well, they have health insurance anyway, cause it's London, uh, which is great. Mm-hmm. But, uh, they have, they go to school. People really do respect them because in London, it's a lot harder to get around than it is here because they don't have a grid. Like New York as crazy and complex as it is. It's numbered, you know, for the, so for the most part, you figure it out. But in London, uh, it's very intense. In New York, you basically take like a five-hour course that's like a defensive driving course. Uh, and then you do have to put in like 30 hours in the classroom of quote-unquote taxi school where they're teaching you geography and the actual bylaws of the Taxi and uh, Limousine Commission. <laughs> so you then take a test. Uh, Just count to 300 and you'll <laughs> make your way up Manhattan. <laughs> 50% of your grade is English. And uh, 50% of your grade is geography. And a lot of people, when they hear that, always get upset because they, they, they believe that most of the cab drivers that pick them up don't speak English. Um, and I'm sure there are a good degree of cab drivers that don't. And I don't know how they get through the English. I, my only thing I, I surmise is that perhaps these schools just pass everybody who pays to take the school. I don't know. Mm. Because they're obviously getting, uh, in addition to being paid for the class, they're getting uh, paid from the TLC once this person puts up a licensing fee. Uh, and get sponsored by the school. Uh, but the other thing I will tell you, though, is a lot of these drivers that are taking this class are, like, way overqualified. They're, like, guys that are, like, heart surgeons in other countries that aren't licensed to practice in our country. Right. So a lot of times guys will get in and give a cab driver a hard time. But the truth is, he's pr- a lot of times, they're a lot smarter than you or me. Ah, I see. Easy to imagine in my case, but hard to imagine. <laughs> ba- basically, like, my favorite story from driving a cab, I had an old man get in. And asked me if I liked baseball. He was like, hey, do you like baseball? And I was like, yeah, I like baseball. And he stuck his hand through the partition. And he was like, yeah, my name's Red Shandis. You know, I used to manage. These guys aren't as tough nowadays as they used to be. And I was like, wow, I've heard of you. You know, you're amazing. Yeah, you used to manage the St. Louis Cardinals. And uh, he told me this wonderful story about baseball and uh, the color barrier and Branch Rickey. And we got up to 110th Street. And uh, he shook my hand. And I went home. And I was so fascinated. And I Googled the guy. And the guy died in 1972. Oh man, maybe it was maybe it was a ghost. That's what I said. I was like, is, is, is was it his ghost? Did I meet his? It was amazing. I felt like I was in the sixth sense, like I was finding out that I was dead, and everybody, you know what I mean, and everybody uh-huh. bizarre. So uh, yeah, it's 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 a crazy gig. But you've got to like talking to people. The hours are psychotic because you work twelve hours a day. You're self-employed, which is nice. So if you don't want to work, there's nobody to call and explain the day away to. Oh, have you uh, driven any uh, living celebrities? I drove Bill Clinton. Uh-huh. Um. A block at uh, Grand Central. You couldn't be bothered. <laughs> that was insane. What happened was they wanted me to drive against traffic um, on 45th Street because he had like three guys with him in the car that I'll assume were Secret Service, but they weren't earpieced up or anything like that. And they got in and he was basically getting out of the car before I knew he was in the car. Hmm. Literally, like the guy got in, he's like, don't turn it on. He handed me five bucks and he's like, we're getting out of the corner. Go that way. And he said it in an, in a, an authoritative enough voice that I was like, all right, this this is going to be okay if I get stopped. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they were out of the car before I knew they were in the car. I see. Um, I, had, uh, I had Dennis Hopper like a few months before he died. Really? Yeah, he was in and uh, basically he had just come from a lunch at the Homestead Steakhouse in which somebody was telling him to convert his estate to gold. Mm. And he wanted to tell me about uh, blonde. He had a theory about blonde women that they could look at him. And, and they knew how much money he was worth within a, within a second of looking at him. He was, like, kind of paranoid. Like, he thought people were out to get his money. Just blonde women? Yeah, he's like, you know what I like about blondes? They can look at you, and within 10 seconds, they know how much money you got. And I was like, ah, I don't know. I don't okay. really know that. I mean, maybe my wife looks at me, and she definitely knows within 10 seconds that I don't have any money. <laughs> maybe it's a good theory. I don't know. Uh, I almost killed Reese Witherspoon on 20th Street. Oh, I think I've heard this story. Yeah, she was walking against traffic on 20. She didn't know that uh, 20th Street, when it gets to 11th Avenue, becomes a one way the other way just for one block. And so she walked across the street looking the wrong way. I had a guy in the car and like I literally she was in between the she was in the center of the hood and I was able to stop the car and she just looked at us. 
And the guy's like, you killed Reese Witherspoon. And I'm like, she's alive. <laughs> you know, I drove, I had this guy, Jim Leyritz, who was a Yankee. He had a huge home run on the 96 World Series. Uh, I'm trying to think if there was anybody else. I think a lot of the times what you do is uh, you drive celebrities and you don't even know they're in the car. Because a lot of times people will get in and they're like wearing sunglasses and they're on the phone. Ah. Uh. So you don't actually interact with them. And the thing about the credit card now, because there's a credit card in taxis, is in a lot of instances there is uh, less interaction because there's no reason for them to talk to you. They're not giving you money. You're not giving them change. Mm -hmm. For me, like I I'm like I'm the annoying cab driver. Like if you obviously and you can talk talking to me. Like if you get in, I'm like, hey, how are you? What's going on? Because I want to know. <laughs> you know. Yeah. But uh, a lot of the times, yeah, they just want to pay with a credit card and get out of there. Sure. I guess that phone thing doesn't work too well to disguise them if they have a like if it's James Earl Jones. I mean, you know. The voice. Yeah. If it's somebody you recognize, you definitely perk up. When it was uh, the guy that I picked up that was on the Yankees, he's not really a well-known guy, but there was, a, it was something about him. He was going to LaGuardia Airport, and it was like I looked at him and was just like, wow, I definitely know him. And I had like no entree into his eyes or anything. He had a hat on, not a Yankee hat, but he had a hat on. And I got a very like a, a short glimpse, but I actually recognized him and talked to him the whole trip. And uh, it was kind of understood that I knew him, and uh, we didn't make a big deal out of it, and it was cool. Yeah. And I drove Smokey Robinson, and a woman that I, I'm sure his mom is not alive because he's an older gentleman, but uh, he had a woman with him uh, old enough to be his mom. And I know where he lives. You know where he lives. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guessing that's where he lives, but uh, I'm not trying to start a stalk Smokey Robinson movement. I think I know where Kevin Klein lives, but. <laughs> is that true? Wow, we're now, now we're playing a game of horse. There's a lot of one-upmanship here. Do you want to trade? <laughs> I know where Flavor Flav lives. Oh, it's right under the uh, Brooklyn Bridge. You can't miss it. <laughs> do you uh, do you ever get lost? Yes. A lot of times what you do in the beginning is when someone asks you to go somewhere that you've never heard of or you really don't know, you ask them if they have a preferred route. You know, you say, you know, you like you, you basically say, like, oh, you going to work? Yeah. Which way do you normally go? Like, ah, uh, you know, I know how to get there, but. I don't drive this. I don't usually drive this time of day. I don't know what the tra traffic's like. And at that point, they always want to volunteer their way. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it is, uh, most of the time, even if you know where you're going, if you're smart, you allow the customer to pick the way if they're willing to. Right. So in the event that you hit traffic, it doesn't look like it's your fault, and you've got to like fight with them. See, I can't stand it when they ask though, because like I don't know. I just want to get there. Oh, absolutely. So if I'm going to the airport, like I just came back from the airport over the holidays and we're coming up on the turn on the highway and he asked me, which route do you want to take? And I was like, what, what? I don't understand. He's like, he gets really angry because he's, he's about to change lanes, but he's not because he doesn't know which way I want to go. I'm like, just get this there faster. <laughs> You're absolutely right. But what happens in New York is I specifically would ask that to like a, if I'm picking him up at Grand Central at seven in the morning and I know they commuted in. Or I'm picking them up at Penn, and I know they commuted in. In your instance, they have no business asking you. They should take you. And what happens a lot of times, though, is they'll get savvy people that, uh, you know, they may be traveling, but they're from New York originally. And a cabbie will try to take them like a roundabout crazy way, and uh, they'll get caught. Yeah. That was a big, like, scandal uh, last summer. You know, because there's a collective psychology in the city, in any city, not just this one, if a cab driver does something terrible, they all get in and project it onto you, mm. which, you know, again, I, if you drive a cab long enough, you really don't, uh, to use the term again, have an emotional investment because you just get it. There's just so much beyond your control. Uh, you just really want to enjoy the day and, you know, try not to get anybody killed. But, uh, yeah, a lot of times, like there was a, a scandal like two years ago where there was one cab driver who had overcharged people by putting the meter on the out of town rate. Mm. And uh, the next day after that story broke, I had two women in my cab that I picked up at Penn. I was only driving them eight blocks. And when we got to Port Authority, I realized at 42nd that I hadn't turned the meter on. So it was not a big deal. So I turned the meter on and was just charging them the 250. That was the in that's the initial get in charge. But it was all I could charge them. We were here. And the fare would have been like 330. I don't know what it would have been. So I, I put on the meter at 250. And a woman in the back goes, your meter's fast, mister. And I'm not paying. Oh. And I knew it was because of that story the day before. Oh. And I was like, what are you going to do? It's $2. I mean, you don't really care. But it was really, it was pretty funny. Luckily, before Lindsay passed out, she did mention one thing she was wondering. So I will ask on her behalf. Because uh, Lindsay lives in Wisconsin. And she wants to know, uh, if she comes to New York, what word of advice do you have for tourists? What are your pet peeves that you wish people wouldn't do when they get into taxis? 
Wow, that's a really good one. Uh, don't watch the TV that's in the back of the cab. Mm. Does anybody do that? <laughs> I, that? It drives me crazy, but there are people that do. And I'm like, you flew all the way here. You trained it here. You boated it here. I'm like, you're in the city. It's all around you right now. And you're literally watching uh, a Kardashian promo. Mm. And I'm like, you're just you're missing the whole city. The best, uh, the best advice I would give is don't be afraid to ask questions. People want to help you. And, you know, especially with New Yorkers, they're a lot nicer than their reputation suggests because most people form their opinion to New Yorkers based on like airports and ports and stuff like that. And those are people that are harried. They're in a rush and uh, they're not generally from here, you know, but the average New Yorker that's walking down the street wants to help you because it's an empowering feeling. You know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Their rents eight million dollars every time the neighbor puts on the microwave, their toilet flushes, <laughs> you know, they want to feel like they they did something right. So they, they love to help you. Don't be afraid to ask people things. Good advice. Uh, before we go, let's talk about Off the Meter. I do five uh, shows a week, tape every day from three to five. It's usually um, the show is patterned to fit in on regular AM talk stations and FM talk stations across the country. So it's not as uh, sophomoric as I'd like it to be. But fitting into mainstream radio is really not about, unfortunately, blazing your own path. The magic of doing a podcast is like you can do whatever you want, which I think is amazing. Uh, but if it's your job, it really is. It's just a job. You know, like I thought it was going to be like, you know, you could do some high minded, crazy stuff. But what we basically do is we're talking about like a world event, uh, you know, at the top of the show. And then there's some type of interactive poll, either through Facebook or a Google voice line or something like that. Then we generally just bring out a guest, whoever is uh, somebody that I'm familiar with that I think will have a slant on uh, whatever's happening. Mm -hmm. Like today we had Helen Hung on the show. Uh, she's a comedian. She's on the Logo channel, the uh, Setup Squad. And uh, the reason she was on the show is there was a big uh, controversy with Papa John's Pizza over the weekend where somebody ordered a pizza at a Papa John's and uh, she was of Asian descent. And on the receipt, the cashier had typed the words, Lady Chinky Eyes. Oh, yeah, it was kind of upsetting. Uh, the woman, for to her credit, just tweeted the picture and uh, laughed about it. She said she was more shocked than hurt or upset. Mm -hmm. But uh, Helen, being a comedian and being uh, of that uh, ethnic descent, uh, we came on the show and just talked about it and made fun of it. Ah. So it's kind of like, you know what I would explain it to you? It's like a, it's like a dinner party uh, prep show. Like if you were going to a dinner party tonight, assuming the dinner party wasn't too highbrow, <laughs> You'd know everything that was going on in the world. Ah, yep. Like if, if you were going to a dinner party at a Chuck E. Cheese or a mall food court, we would have you prepped. <laughs> Along with jokes. Yes. Just don't. I don't want anybody with uh, anything higher than a GED. <laughs> uh, if it gets beyond that, we are screwed. I'm going to be fair. It's sort of evolved over time. What's the current or where do you want it to be in 2012? Like, what's the plan? Pretty. It's a really crazy show in that uh, when it originally when this show started, I guess the goal was just to get it on terrestrial radio. Um, now it's being handled by actual radio syndicators. Hmm who are trying to put it on like 50 stations at once. Nice. So now it's like playing AAA baseball. Uh, I guess my goal is I want to be on those stations, and uh, that's like the mission statement of 2012. So you'll hear the show uh, without a steady time slot. It'll appear on other radio stations uh, throughout the week, uh, like unbeknownst to me because they're basically workshopping it for like mass distribution. Okay. So my goal is essentially to be doing it, is to be doing the same show but with healthcare. How does that sound? <laughs> that sounds good to me. It's a decent goal, right? Yeah. It's a decent goal. It's nothing crazy. Forget it, I'm a cabbie. I don't have a lot of ambition. <laughs> Are you still planning to take it on the road, or is that not working out? No. What happened is we did tape uh, Ophira Eisenberg, who's great, and myself happened to tape things over the summer, and we would get in a cab, drive around, try to interview some people, uh, drop some audio on them, like run a poll question through them like that. And uh, what we found was the rate of return is, you know, you've got to record like 12 hours to come up with an hour. Oh, God. You know what I mean? Because there's just so much like in between chatter and stuff that doesn't amount to anything. Sure. And then there's consent forms and everything like that. It wound up being more of a physical undertaking. I think that's a brilliant idea if you were if you had a TV show and you had a serious budget. Right. Uh, the budget for this project, which is not a terrible budget, but uh, it's designed to build a real radio show. You can 
team up with Ben Bailey or something. <laughs> yeah, hey, you know what's funny about that? So many people, because I'm like one of the very few like American guys driving a cab, or or was anyway, is guys people would frequently get in and ask if it was the cash cab. Oh, really? Oh. <laughs> I literally, yeah, I had like a group of people once that I drove down to the Ritz Carlton uh, in Battery Park. That literally, when they got in the cab on 34th Street, I heard one girl whisper to the guy, "This is the guy from the game show." Oh no. And literally, they kept trying to, like, pry conversation on me on the West Side Highway. Uh, and when we were getting close to their hotel, the guy's like, so, do you have any questions you want to ask us? Oh. And I was like, where are you from? And the girl's like, it's not him. Aww. I was like, no, it's not. So Ben Bailey, a guy I'm, like, slightly, ever so slightly friendly with. Yeah. Deep down, I resent, not because of his success, but because of the difficulty uh, he would supply me with daily. Anytime a woman got in my cab with uh, running pants, like a, a, a full jogging suit on, basically you have two women from Long Island that are going to The View. Anytime they got in my cab, I heard about Cash Cab immediately. Oh, no. <laughs> so what can I say? We're on our way. Sorry to bring it up. I know, right? You're like, gosh. But uh, I always wished I could have a game show, and like, if they got the questions wrong, they paid me. Well... That's a good one. So, um, where can people find you online? Go to Facebook, uh, Jimmy Fallon, F A I L L A. Uh, my Twitter handle is at uh, Jimmy Fallon. Uh, you can find me in iTunes as Jimmy Fallon. If my show isn't in a market uh, that you receive, uh, you can get it on iTunes and you can go to jimmyfallon.com, F A I L L A. Um, it's funny, obviously, a lot of people will pronounce it and it'll sound like Jimmy Fallon, mm -hmm. which is another great buzzkill for a comedy crowd. <laughs> You're doing like a horrible gig in like the Catskills, like two in the morning on a Thursday, and they think Jimmy Fallon is showing up. Uh, and I want to say to them that if Jimmy Fallon was actually doing this gig, that would mean he had like such a spectacular fall from grace that we're going to watch the greatest behind the music of all time <laughs> when they finally chronicle that. It's like that band called Free Bear. It's Very good. Somebody was just, I think Gaffigan was talking about that. I'm not even kidding. Seriously? I think, I think he mentioned it in his act. I'm not even kidding. I win. You are. You talk about the parallel thought of uh, really sharp intellects. Look at you. Well, this was fun. I really appreciate you having me on, buddy. You guys are putting up good content. You have a great uh, following of very smart people, obviously, who have exquisite palates. Aw, shucks. All I really want someday is uh, if she comes out of a drug-induced coma, I just want to be your cab driver. I just want to take you guys to the airport. When Lindsay comes, we can we can go see your stand up and then you can uh you can drive us to our destination how's that sound it would be amazing i will and i will and i'll take you the short way because you're good people oh thanks no chicanery for you dear <laughs> all right we'll talk, talk real soon okay thank you buddy. Bye. bye oh i must have dozed off for a couple minutes there is jimmy here yet is it time to start the interview